church, what is going on today? I am so glad that you're here. Whether somebody shared this video with you or maybe you've been waiting patiently for the video to premiere, whatever it is, we're glad that you get to be a part of what we're doing today and uh, you always have a place here at the Shores Church. But listen, it is so good to be hanging out with you today because most Sundays I'm hanging out with your wild kids, but today I get to hang out with you and that is a really good feeling. Um, and can I just say this too, that it is my greatest joy being your kids and youth pastor. Like it really is. I think about all these things that I wanted to do and wanted to be growing up and God just changed that in me. Like he totally radically changed that inside of me to where this is the only thing that I want to do. And it is incredible. Like, have you ever been driving before? Like you're in autopilot mode, somewhere that you've been a million times, whether, whether you're driving home from work or you're driving to work or you're coming to church, whatever it is, you're driving and you start to zone out because you know the way it becomes muscle memory at that point. And all of a sudden you have a snap to moment and you're like, oh, oh, how did I get here? Who gave me my license, right? That's kind of how it is for me here. I'll be at work and I'll be at my desk or maybe I'll be at home doing something random. And all of a sudden I'll snap back to it and be like, oh my gosh, how did I get here? Seriously, how am I so fortunate to be on staff at a church teaching your kids about Jesus. It is my greatest, greatest joy. So thank you for allowing me to speak into your kids' lives and also allowing me to speak into your life today. Um, before we get started, uh, we have this verse that we always start with in our youth service. It's my one of my favorite verses in the whole entire Bible. Let me set the stage for you really quick. Right, the earth is formless and empty, and the Spirit of the Lord is hovering over it. Right, He's getting ready to make something. He's getting ready to create. This is in the book of Genesis, the start of everything. Right, and He starts making the water and heaven and trees and fish and all these different things, right? And he creates mankind. And in Genesis 131, right? This is the verse. It says, and God saw all that he made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. I love this verse so much. Why? Because have you ever painted or crafted or created something and you had to take a step back, right? You had to take a step back and look at it and be like, wow, I made that. Or maybe you're not really handy or creative and you're like, oh my gosh, I made that, right? <laughs> or even your kids, some of you look at your kids, they do something cute, they're enjoying life, they're laughing, they're joyful, right? And you look at your kid and you're like, wow, I made that. Or some of you still are like, oh my gosh, I made that, right? But you have the sense of pride in what you made. And here's the creator of everything, right? The creator of the elephants, the sky, the water, the penguins, the Chick-fil-A's. Come on, somebody. But the creator of everything had to take a step back and look at his creation and say, wow, I made that. And here's the best part about it. Are you ready for this? Here's my favorite part about this. Because within all of that creation is you. And it doesn't just say that he's like, hey, that's okay, or that's just good. No, God looks at you and says that you are very good. So here's the thing. I don't believe in luck, but I do believe in divine appointment. I don't think that you're here by accident. I don't think that you just stumbled across this video or this series or this church. Whether you've been watching this whole time we've been online, maybe you got saved at this church, maybe you served at this church, maybe maybe you got baptized at this church, or maybe you're still trying to figure out this whole Christian thing. Here is what I want to challenge you with this morning. That maybe you don't like anything that I say today. That's all right. Maybe you don't like our sermon series. Maybe you don't like the carpets. Me neither. But maybe whatever it is that's holding you back today, can I challenge you with this? While you're here, will you allow yourself to hear from God? Because here's the thing. God wants to speak to you. God has a word for you. So can I challenge you with that this morning? 
And before we get started, let's pray. Lord, help us this morning. Speak to us. Have your way today, Lord. We ask that whatever is blocking us from receiving everything that you have for us, from hearing from you, Lord, I pray that you just cut it off right now, that it is abolished and destroyed, and that we can start running to you, Lord. We can start diving into your word. We can start hearing from you clearly. Jesus, speak through me today. Let your Holy Spirit have its way. We ask all of this in Jesus' beautiful, precious name. And everyone says, amen. Listen, we've been in a series called Paparazzi, and we've been studying the book of James. And aren't we so fortunate and lucky that we have a pastor who sees the value in reading the Bible together? So here's what we're going to do today. We're in James chapter 4. We're going to tackle this bad boy together. And I promise you it's not that long. But before we get into the chapter, let me give you some backgrounds about James, okay? James is Jesus' half-brother. I mean, talk about pressure. Could you imagine being James's, Jesus' half-brother? I mean, I just picture that time when Jesus turns water into wine and Mary walks over and goes, James? Your brother just turned water into wine and you brought a cookie tray from Myers, right? I mean, think about it. It is a classic sibling rivalry. It reminds me of my own sister and me, right? One of us got good grades, went to college, got her bachelor's degree, and is working for their master's. And one of us dropped out of college and became a pastor. I mean, I wonder which is which, right? That classic sibling rivalry. Um, in Hebrew, James is translated as Yaakov. And in Greek, it's Yaakobos. His letters, the whole book of James, right, were letters written for all of Jesus's followers and to challenge how we live. Chapters two through five are all about living wholeheartedly, and devoted to Jesus. He was a leader for over 20 years. He saw things like famine, poverty, and persecution. He was a pillar of the church and was known as the peacemaker until he was tragically murdered. I say all of that to say this. Even though that James was Jesus's brother, even though he saw how Jesus grew up, he was able to set aside everything that was about himself to glorify everything that was about Jesus. I mean, come on, think about it. How many of us could do that for our own sibling? Set aside everything that's about ourselves to follow our sibling. Better yet, lay down our life for them. I bet you that number is not high. I bet you a lot of us would not do that, but here we are in the book of James where he does that. Plus, James was in Jesus' inner circle. Even in the 12 disciples, he was in Jesus' inner circle, right? So everything in this chapter, in this book, is important. And that's where we're at today, James chapter 4. So what do you think? Are you, do you think we're ready to tackle this? If you got your Bibles, why don't you go ahead and open up to James chapter 4. If you don't got your Bibles... That is tough luck. Just kidding. We have it on some slides for you. But let's take a look, shall we? What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war with you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not have because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? In the NIV version, it says hostility, that you are purposely being hostile to God. And listen to what it says next. Are you ready? Or do you suppose that it is without purpose that scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? He gives us more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before God and let 
and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but are a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Come now, you who, you who say... Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you don't you don't know what tomorrow will bring. So all you schedulers and type A people and and very prepared people, gotcha. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is a sin. All right. Wow. Do me a favor and just shake it off a little bit. Just shake it up a little bit and take a couple of deep breaths because that seemed like a lot and that was a lot, right? And it seemed a little harsh. Have you ever been yelled at before and it kind of just ruins your whole day, whether it's at work or school or whatever, right? We don't like to be yelled at, but let me just promise you this, that that's not what is happening right here in the book of James, right? He's not yelling at you. This is a warning or even a heads up. So you're all good. I promise you that. But I, there's a lot of things in this chapter that I love. I love when it says that you shouldn't speak badly about your neighbor. I love that it says, you know, draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. There's a lot of things that I love in this book, but it would take so long to unpack every little thing that's in this chapter. Like we could literally do a whole series just off of James chapter four. So I just want to point out some important key things that Jesus was speaking to me about the chapter. Like I said, this book was written by somebody who knew Jesus very well. And I couldn't imagine that Jesus was any different than he was at home in his ministry. He was the same across the board. So James got to see Jesus very closely. And this chapter is labeled a warning against worldliness. And that's exactly what it does, right? This is a warning against worldliness. Um, and we all have experienced how crazy and unpredicting that this world is, right? We've seen it firsthand. And when humans are left to their own decisions, our own devices, we make some pretty ridiculous choices. Am I right? Um, we start to value things like money, cars, clothes, sex, busyness, schedules, politics, and many other things that are over God, right? All of those things are more important to God than us. And that's when it becomes dangerous. That's when it becomes sinful. It's okay to like things and have hobbies and be invested in things, right? That's not what I'm saying. You like guns? Fine. You like politics? All right. You like debate? Sure. You can like cars and have houses and jobs and dreams and ambitions, whatever. Sure. But if all of that, all those things I said and more supersedes God, that's when we get it wrong. The world doesn't need any more of those things. The world, what the world needs and what your soul needs is a savior, a king, a God with mercy and grace and justice. There are two sides to this world, right? You can have the world, which offers you pain and suffering, and hurt, and sin, and guilt, instant gratification, money, sex, and idolatry, right? This is the world. But on this side, you can have Jesus, who offers you things like grace, and forgiveness, and righteousness, and love, and calling, and blessings, and purpose, and change, right? God has given us the freedom, free will, to make our own decisions in this lifetime. So if God has given us that decision, why in the world would we choose this side when we can have Jesus? Right, let me make something clear. Following Jesus isn't going to be easy. When you follow Jesus, you say no to sin. When you follow Jesus, you say no to your past and you say yes to him and all the things that he has 
for you. And it's going to be hard sometimes. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. This is important. This is a lean in moment. Are you ready? Right? Following Jesus isn't easy. But if it's important to God, then we need to fight for that too. Let me say it again. If you didn't write it down, write it down this time. If it's important to God, then we need to fight for that too. Living a life of sexual in sexual purity. If that's important to God, we need to fight for that too. If being generous is important to God, giving tithe, giving to missionaries, whatever it is, being generous to people, then we need to fight for that too. If choosing to edify your brother instead of tearing them down is important to God, then we need to fight for that too. We need to start fighting for every person. We need to start fighting for experiences with Christ. We need to start fighting for intentional discipleship. We need to start fighting for General, or joyful generosity. We need to start fighting for common unity. If it's important to God, then we need to fight for that too. And if you don't want to, that's fine. That's your decision. You have the freedom to choose the world, to stay right here. But the best part about choosing Jesus, and it says right in James chapter 4, if you choose his grace, if you choose his forgiveness, then two things will happen. Are you ready? The first one is this. James chapter 4 just said, if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. How many people are thankful that we have an ever-present God in our life, a God who chooses to be with you through the good and the bad? When you draw near to him, he draws near to you, right? That is the presence of the Lord who's in your life. The second, the second thing says, if you humble yourself to God, you come back to him and you resist temptation, the devil will flee. The devil ain't going to stick around because he knows he's not a match for Jesus's power. He's not a match for the one who's protecting you. So go ahead and choose the world if you want to. But if coming to Jesus and fighting for what's important to him gets me here, then I I choose Jesus. I choose him every single time. Some of us are fighting for the wrong thing and we know it. Some of us are fighting for a toxic relationship. Some of us are fighting to win an argument. Some of us are fighting just because everyone else is fighting, right? You hop on board because you see this random fight. You want to be a part of it, right? And some of us are fighting to find our identity. And this whole series right now is called Paparazzi, right? Can we live a life pleasing to God while the whole world is watching? Can we do that? And we know that some of us have felt the heat of that. We make one small mistake as a Christian and people are all over us, so quick to condemn us. But let me just say this, if that's the world's response, if that's the world's response to condemn and quick to judge, why should that be our response? You know, in youth, our vision for youth, um, one thing that we do is called N-O-B-A-O-B. -O -B. Um, and some of you have probably heard it before. Some of you probably saw it on our shirts and our hats and stuff like that. Um, but what does it mean? What does it mean? Right? N-O-B-A-O-B -B means that it's never our best, always our better. Everything in the book of James is important, right? Everything is important. But can I say this, that the standard that is set for all Christians in this book, it's impossible to get right every single time. And like, Pastor Parker, didn't you say if it's important, then we need to fight for it too, 100%. But I promise you this, we're going to fail and we're going to mess up. The Shores youth knows that very well, right? That's why we have N-O-B, A-O-B. And, and what does that mean, though? What does it mean, never our best, always our better? It means this, that there's never going to be a time in your life. There's never going to be a version of yourself where you're unteachable. You've learned everything that you know. You've seen everything that you need to see, and you've experienced everything that you need to experience. There's never going to be a time like that where you're the best of the best. So why is that important? 
Why is that our dream? Our dream, like many other churches' dreams and youth groups and ministries' dream, is to grow. And we want people from all walks of life to come to our youth and know that they don't have to be perfect to be a part of our family. They can't do that if we're not humble. N-O-B, A-O-B, not our best always are better. If our response is the same as the world's, if we condemn for mistakes and there is no grace, then how are we any different from the world? There are men out there who feel helpless because they can't lead their families. There are women out there who feel that they don't have a voice. There are young girls out there who don't see their identity in Christ, who are selling their bodies at a discounted price. They're worth so much more than that, right? There are students who are filled with anger and anxiety and depression and are tired and or feeling that one day one of these people are going to walk through those doors, right? Oh my gosh, I got ahead of myself. Sorry. But listen, one day, one day, one of these people that I just described and many others, they're going to walk through our doors and are we prepared to receive them? Are we going to respond the, the way the world responds? Are we going to respond the way Jesus responds? Can we be a church that accepts people and has open arms where they come in. While the whole world is watching the church, are we going to be a church that looks like the world or are we going to be a church that points people to grace and truth and love and peace and joy and righteousness? Can we be that church and how do we get there? I have three things I want to challenge you on. So if you're able, why don't you take some notes and these three things that our church needs to be in order to stand out of this world are this. Are you ready for this? Write this down. Number one, we need to be a church that accepts. We have to be. You know, in Titus 2.11, it says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. For all people. That's one of our values, right? Every person, God's grace, God's forgiveness, God's calling, God's purpose is for every person. And that's what it says right here. For grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. We need to be a church that accepts because there's going to be people walking into this church with lifestyles that we don't agree with. But if we can accept them for who they are and say, listen, there's a better life for you. There's grace for you. Instead of turning them away and say, listen, you can't be here. Come back when your life is all better. No, we point them and say, listen, you need to choose this. Grace has appeared for all people. Can we be a church that accepts every person, all stages of life? Number two is this, a church that prays. We need to be a church that prays. We need to be a church that never stops ceasing prayers, right? It says right here, it says, uh, Rejoice always, praying without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Listen, we need to be a church that never stops praying. We need to be a church that never stops asking for the Holy Spirit. We need to be a church that intercedes and stands in the gap for these people. The ones who are in this world and here's Jesus. We need to be right here in the middle that are praying for all these people and help them get here. Can we be a church that prays? Church that accepts, church that prays. And the last one is this, a church that goes. A church that accepts, a church that prays and a church that goes. We need to be a church that goes to people. Jesus met us where we're at. Whether you grew up in the church or maybe you have a crazy background, a crazy uh, transformation story, Jesus was able to meet us where we're at. Why can't the church be that to other people and go and meet them where they're at, right? If we're in our church and we're waiting for people to come to us, we have the wrong mindset and we're going to be waiting a really long time. But we need to be a church that goes. We need to be a church that accepts all people, a church that prays and a church that goes, right? We can't just wait for other people. If we are just a building full of Christians and we don't have, we don't have it right, we got it wrong. We need to be a church that goes. And listen, 
wherever you're at, I'm ending right now, I promise. Wherever you're at, if you're in your home or you're in your basement or your car, will you just say the Great Commission with me? Can we be reminded right now of that we need to be a church that goes? The commission that God laid on our hearts, right? Here we go. Say it with me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Man, while the whole world is watching, can we as a church, we as a community, we as a family of believers be these three things that when people look at us, they're like, man, there's something different about them. That's where Jesus lives. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you for this day. Jesus, thank you that we get to be together learning about your word and just talking about everything that you're doing in our lives. Jesus, I just pray that that conversation never stops. And Lord, some of us are stressed. Some of us are burned out. Some of us are tired. Some of us are lost and struggling to find who we are. Lord, if we can just get onto this idea that we are a church that accepts, a church that prays, and a church that goes, Lord, we know that your spirit will be in us. We know that you're going to help us and teach us and guide us. But all of my friends that are watching right now, Jesus, I just pray that your peace, your joy, and your righteousness starts to fill their hearts. Jesus, they can't find peace in this world. They can't find joy in this world. They can't find righteousness in this world. That's only something that you can provide. So can you do that for my friends this morning? Jesus, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Hey, church, we love you. We are so glad that you joined us this morning. And there's so much more to come. The best has just started for us as a church. And it's going to be incredible. We love you and we'll see you next time. Thank you.